let's finish up chapter 14 with hurricanes, the last of our uh, low pressure systems. So hurricanes are tropical cyclones, tropical low pressure systems uh, that form between latitudes of five degrees and 20 degrees all over the tropical oceans, except the South Atlantic uh, and the Eastern South Pacific. Water temperature, not warm enough there. Has to be, water temperature has to be 80 degrees Fahrenheit or over. Hurricanes start out as thunderstorms. And remember a thunderstorm is a low pressure system. So that means that air is being pulled into these low pressure systems from high pressure systems. And there's plenty of water vapor in the air because this is all happening over the oceans. And those thunderstorms then will start out as tropical depressions. A tropical depression is what we call one of these storms that um, if the wind speed is less than 38 miles per hour, then it takes on the designation of a tropical storm if the wind speed is between 38 to 74 miles per hour. And at that point, it gets a name. And if it turns into a hurricane, which means that the wind speeds are in excess of 74 miles per hour, then it will keep that name. The severity of hurricanes is ranked on the Saffir Simpson scale, and it goes from category one to category five. A cat five storm has wind speeds over 150 miles per hour. Category five storms are the most severe. And the lowest pressure ever recorded was in a hurricane. Actually, it was in a typhoon, but a typhoon is what we call a hurricane if it occurs in the Western Pacific Ocean. This is an artifact in the lecture from 2018 when there was a major, major hurricane headed toward the Outer Banks of North Carolina. And the Weather Service, uh, NOAA, National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, and the, uh, the a hurricane Prediction Center were all putting out these um, just very, very dire warnings about what this uh, hurricane was capable of doing. And I'll always like to point this out because these organizations are very conservative. They don't want to go out on a limb and tell people things that then when it doesn't happen, it's like chicken little, the sky is falling, then you know, nothing much happens. And then the next time something happens, people won't listen to the warnings. So they don't like to do that. So you know that when they are giving warnings like this, um, that something big is coming into an area. So they were calling it life-threatening, catastrophic flash flooding, significant river flooding, damaging hurricane force winds, likely along portions of the coast of South Carolina and North Carolina, large swells, meaning large waves, uh, and it lived up to its reputation. Again, it's not, it's not that the frequency of hurricanes is increasing, but the severity, the amount of damage that they're doing, especially with the flooding that comes along with the hurricanes, that is on the increase. So this was um, the influence the area under influence from uh, 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 sorry from uh, Hurricane Florence. You see the Outer Banks area. This part of North Carolina just kind of juts out into the ocean. You see the barrier islands here. No place to be during a hurricane. You're caught between the Atlantic and you're caught, uh, caught between the uh, the lagoon areas behind here. Um, so uh, it sticks out kind of like a sore thumb. So hurricanes don't have much of a chance if they're headed in that direction, they don't have much of a chance to miss this area. And there's Florence on her way to North Carolina. And you see the counterclockwise spin, you see the eye in the middle. So all of these are rain bands out in advance of the hurricane actually arriving. And then the, the most destructive part of the hurricane is surrounding that eye. Then uh, this is, um, I hope this link is still working. Um, this is from the New York Times and it's some pictures from Hurricane Harvey. That was a late season storm that took 
most people by surprise. It was huge, hit New Jersey, uh, New York. Um, so if you get a chance, uh, take a look at some of the pictures from Harvey, another one of these incredibly deadly storms. Okay, so how do we name hurricanes? Well, by international agreement, uh, we have a list of names that are one, two, three, four, six years out. And the names will be repeated. Uh, for example, after 2020, then we'll go back to the 2015 names. The only thing that will change here is if there is a hurricane that is of historical significance, then that name gets retired. So for example, in 2019, Let's see who probably will be retired here. Hmm, probably none of those. Florence will be retired. I would think Michael would be retired. Michael was the one that hit the panhandle of Florida and other areas, but it was a category five when it made landfall. And it was like, a, if you look at pictures of some of these areas that were impacted, it's like a nuclear bomb went off. Uh, so again, any of the ones that do lots of damage, the name gets retired and it gets replaced by a name that starts with the same letter. Some of these names for hurricanes are a kind of a, not what you would give to a deadly storm of this type, like Teddy, Hurricane Teddy. That doesn't seem to be something that you'd be really afraid of, or Sally, or Wendy. So some of these names are pretty uh, interesting to look at. Also, the other thing about naming, up until the 1970s, hurricanes only had women, only had female names. So that was at the height of the women's lib movement. And there was a big effort to get that to change because it didn't seem to be fair that these highly destructive, deadly storms were only named after, uh, after females. So after that, it changed. So we have, um, that it alternates, starting out with female, then male, female, male, female, male. This was uh, um, also in 2018, there was Florence headed to North Car Carolina and right behind it was Isaac and Helene. At that time, Isaac was just a storm. That, these are the symbols that the um, National Hurricane Service will use to show um, that's a full-fledged uh, hurricane. If it has a little circle in the middle, that's the storm. It's, it's still just a storm. And if it's just a plain circle, that would be a tropical depression. And this is what those look like from the air. So you can see that, that spin, that counterclockwise spin into the eye of the hurricane, counterclockwise. Again, because of Coriolis deflecting things to the right in the northern hemisphere. This map shows uh, hurricane um, tracks and intensity of these hurricane-like storms. Again, if they happen over here, and you can see this is a very busy area right here, they are called typhoons. This area hits the, uh, the, the typhoons that occur here are going to hit Japan, um, the Philippines, some of the Pacific Islands. And lately, they haven't just been called typhoons, they're being called super typhoons. If the storms happen over here in this part of the Atlantic or in this part of the Pacific, they are called hurricanes. And you can see that this is a busy area, but certainly we don't have the, the, the dark fives, the number of fives that they've had over here in the Pacific. Then if they happen in the Indian Ocean, they are referred to as cyclones. And you can see that this area, Bay of Bengal right here, is uh, a pretty busy area for hurricanes too. A lot of, of areas here in the desert, a lot of them will get water. A lot of these places that are dry as a bone will get much needed water from these hurricanes that make landfall. The other thing to point out here is right here around the equator. You see no hurricanes at all or typhoons or cyclones, whatever ocean that we're in. You don't see any here. It's clear as a bell. 
that's because these storms need that spin. They need Coriolis to give them the spin. And um, Coriolis is zero at the equator. So we're not going to see any. We, we wouldn't see storms crossing the equator either. And then there's just this lone one here. Let's go back. That is, that took uh, people in Brazil by, by surprise because there are usually no hurricanes in the South Atlantic because the water's too cold. But this one hit. Uh, and after it hit, they realized, that, hey, that was a hurricane. So Northwest Pacific, much more active than the North Atlantic. Indian Ocean, also very active. Again, they're called cyclones here. South Atlantic and Southeast Pacific rarely have hurricanes because of the cold ocean water and hurricanes feed on that warm water. And they're not going to form close to the equator because there's no Coriolis at the equator. So what are the impacts on humans? Well, wind, of course. Wind speed is something that we have to pay attention to with, uh, with hurricanes. But the most deadly impacts come from flooding. High precipitation, because there's going to be a lot of rainfall coming from these hurricanes. Um, but there's also storm surge. Storm surge happens as a result of the winds pushing this water into inland areas. Uh, the higher the wind, the higher the storm surge is going to be. And if storm surge happens at high tide, then that makes the flooding more intense and more deadly. So we want to pay attention to where the storm is going to make landfall, where the eye is going to make landfall, because it depends on what side of the eye that we're on as to, to uh, whether you get the brunt of the storm or it's not as, um, as severe. So you have to pay attention to normal high tide. Here's mean sea level. That's normal high tide. This house has been built thinking, OK, everything's OK. We're above high tide. But you fail to take into account what the height of the storm surge is going to be. Those wind whipped uh, waves coming in along with the precipitation. This is one of those cyclones that I mentioned that uh, happened in the Arabian Sea and, and hit, uh, impacting these um, uh, usually very dry areas like Oman and Yemen, uh, these places that have a deficit of water. Uh, this was uh, Shapala, Cyclone Shapala, headed toward the Arabian Peninsula in 2015, and they had a lot of flooding in the desert. And then shortly after that one, another one made landfall. So this is wind damage from uh, hurricanes that hit in Florida. Um, Dr. Ted Fujita had always proposed that there are funnel clouds that are embedded in hurricanes. And when you see some of the damages from hurricanes, it looks exactly like what you would see from tornadoes. Uh, so where you see the most massive damage like this, it's from those tornadoes that are embedded in the eye wall of the, of the hurricane. Here's storm surge. This was from, from Katrina. And this is storm surge that's impacting a barrier island. This was hur Hurricane Ike in Galveston, Texas in 2008, uh, with massive flooding associated with it, storm surge. And this is the Outer Banks of North Carolina. Um, this is not a good place to build your house. There's no protection whatsoever. And you can see they've tried to sandbag it, but uh, that is uninhabitable now. More storm surge. This is in Connecticut. Um, that was from Hurricane Irene. And then this is the extent of Hurricane Sandy, that, that storm that hit in 2012. And you can see how large, how large of an area that impacted, but the brunt of it fell in the uh, northeast, New Jersey in particular. That's damage. That was a Oceanside 
um, uh, what do you call it, Oceanside Playground, I guess, with rides and things. And that was the roller coaster. And you see where it ended up from the storm surge. These are all homes that were damaged from Sandy. So there have been only four Category 5 storms that have made landfall in the U.S. to date. Michael in 2018, Andrew in 1992, um, and um, Camille in 1969. And then there was one in 1935 before we started naming storms. So this place right here, this apartment complex in, during the 1969 Camille, that became pretty famous for a bad reason because there were like 20 people that stayed behind to have a hurricane party. That's what happened to it after the storm surge hit. Uh, and there was only one person out of the 20 that survived, the rest of them drowned. So don't play around with hurricanes. Florence, again, Florence stalled and dumped 35 inches of rain on the coastal plain, massive flooding. Michael had a wind speed of 155 miles per hour, did extensive damage, uh, damaged a um, Air Force base with all kinds of buku expensive airplanes that were damaged beyond repair. And this is what the town of, I think this is Mexico Beach in uh, Florida. That's what it looked like. Uh, one home survived here, and that's because it had a one foot thick concrete and the roof was secured by steel cables. So they had really tried to hurricane proof that house as much as possible, and it looks like it paid off. This area was hit by a 20 foot storm surge. And you see things were swept, buildings were swept right off the foundation. Look at all this trash and debris left behind. That was Michael again. And this is the cross section of a hurricane. Um, again, we're talking about a low pressure center. So air converges into the area of lowest pressure. And we get this air that's uplifted, but then as it gets higher, it cools off and it starts sinking. And remember, sinking air is stable air. That's that area of clear from the top of the storm to the ocean. And it's just totally clear. Back in the day before we knew what hurricanes actually were, when people experienced these, the eye would reach them and they would think, I guess until they started realizing what these storms are all about, they would think that the storm was over. But it wasn't. It's just that uh, the eye is passing over and it might take an hour or less for the eye to pass, but then the other half of the storm is coming and it's just as severe as the first half. It's just that the wind speed will be from a different direction, or sorry, the, not the wind speed, but the wind will be from a different direction. The eye wall is where the most precipitation will be, where the highest winds will be, the eye wall surrounding that eye. And that's what it looks like. That's the eye of a hurricane. And we have these hurricane hunter planes that fly into these storms to send back information about the wind speed, the wind direction, the humidity, the pressure. Um, and this was a category four storm. And again, you see that perfect eye wall and very distinct boundary between the eye itself and the eye wall. There's another one. And this is the eye of Katrina, perfectly blue sky. And then you have all of the, the turbulence that's in the eye wall. Another eye wall. So if you look at the, at the path that these hurricanes take, some of them start in the Gulf of Mexico, some of them start over here off the coast of Africa and they all get in that belt of northeast trade winds and they're pushed to the west. 
and then they will t get into the belt of westerlies and they get pushed back toward the northeast. So they all have that same kind of, of uh, movement associated with them. They don't all, it's not all, they're not all superimposed upon each other, but they all basically spin that way, move that way. This was the 1995, yeah, 1995 storm tracks. And there were a, a lot of uh, hurricanes that year. And this was the 2005 Atlantic storm tracks. There were so many named storms that year that we ran out of names and we had to go to the Greek alphabet. So after we run out of the names that are on those lists, if there are more uh, storms and hurricanes, we have to go to the Greeks. So alpha, beta, gamma, so I see alpha, beta, gamma, and epsilon. So we got up to E in the Greek alphabet. Busy year. There was a Maria and a Harvey. I would say that after Maria hit Puerto Rico and did what, did the damage that she did, that name is going to be retired. Harvey will be retired. And this is Floyd. Floyd is one of those hurricanes that hit the Outer Banks, but it it terrorized basically the entire Southeast. It didn't make landfall, but everybody thought it was going to make landfall. So Florida thought it was going to make landfall. They called for evacuations. Then Georgia thought it was going to make landfall. They called for evacuations. South Carolina thought it was going to make landfall. They called for evacuations. It did not make landfall in any of those states. It made landfall again in North Carolina, but it was sitting out here just churning, churning, churning. So well before Floyd got there, North Carolina was getting rain, rain, rain. There it is. Nice eye there. Uh, and I'll show you some of the damages from that. So this is what uh, I was speaking about with where, on what side of the hurricane would you, if you had to be in a hurricane, which side would you want to be on? This is the worst part of the hurricane. This quadrant right here is the worst part to be uh, in because what's happening is all the wind is pushing all the water this direction. So it's pushing it toward land. And the net wind speed is going to be, well, the, the movement of the hurricane in this example is 50 kilometers per hour. Uh, the wind is 175 kilometers per hour. So those two get added together. So the net wind speed on this side of the hurricane is going to be 225 kilometers per hour, as opposed to any place that's on this side, down here on this side of the, of the hurricane, um, we have to subtract that, that wind speed or that net movement from the wind speed. So 175 uh, minus 50 uh, gives us 125 kilometers per hour versus 220, come down here, 225 kilometers per hour. And that can make all the difference for people. So it pays to pay attention to where the hurricane is going to make landfall. This is what happens when you have so much water in these areas. These are coastal plain areas and the water table is very close to the surface. So when it rains like that, the water's got no place to go. It can't infiltrate into the ground anymore. So what started happening was caskets started floating up out of the ground. Not a, a site that you would want to see if you opened your door. And then, of course, there was Katrina. Um, there's a Superdome where, you know, all that horrible stuff happened. Um, and then there were other horrible things that happened, too. These were uh, caskets that had washed up out of the, floated up out of the ground because the ground was so waterlogged. That was one of the major problems that we never heard too much about. Then North Carolina has all kinds of pig farms. These poor pigs had nowhere to go. They started drowning. Farmers tried to bury them. 
in the high areas, what little high areas there were, but the rain kept falling and then those high areas ended up uh, being flooded and the carcasses of the pigs started floating out of the ground. So this was a huge environmental disaster, health hazard, groundwater contamination, surface water contamination. And then something that we don't think about so much, these, all these cars in the parking lot were flooded and all the lubricants came out of the cars. And this was one more component of the environmental disaster that Floyd ended up unleashing in the state of North Carolina. They had barely recovered and then they start getting pounded by Matthew and Florence. years later, but still the damage from all of this environmental, uh, all these environmental hazards uh, was hard to overcome. Speaking of Matthew, there's Matthew in 2016. Uh, this is North Carolina again being flooded. This was Matthew in Florida. You see the storm surge. And this is before and after Katrina. Uh, these barrier islands. This is bad uh, when, when you have these barrier islands, they can accept some of the brunt, they can uh, diminish some of the energy of that storm, um, but not in the case of Katrina. And now the next, next storm that comes along, you don't even have the, the size of the barrier islands anymore to help uh, expend some of the energy more damage from Katrina. That was Bay St. Louis, Mississippi before Katrina. That's what it looked like after Katrina. Homes just gone. And this is part of our Hurricane Hunter Squadron. Um, they're the Air Force Weather Reconnaissance Squadron. And there's, there's one stationed at Keesler Air Force Base in Mississippi. I think there's another one somewhere in the Caribbean. Um, and they fly these planes into the hurricanes to let the scientists know um, in order to try to, to forecast where these storms are going and what the severity is going to be. And these are some of the other planes that we have at our arsenal to fly into the storm. So how do hurricanes die out? They die from lack of fuel. Remember, latent heat energy is the fuel, and they're getting a lot of that over warm water. So they will start decaying when they move over land because there's no more water vapor. I shouldn't say no more, there's less water vapor, or if they move over cold ocean water. When they move over land, that doesn't mean that we don't have to worry about them anymore because they can still pack a punch. This was Camille. Camille wreaked havoc along this whole path here whole path here. It started out, uh, come on, started out here and then went through Mississippi, went through Tennessee, went through Kentucky, went through southern West Virginia and into Virginia and it, we had in Virginia we had extensive flooding. Damage in the aftermath of Camille killed 300 people in Virginia when 27 inches of rain fell in eight hours. The scars of the landslides can still be seen. If you travel into the Blue Ridge Mountains, you can still see the scars from uh, those landslides. Okay, so that does it for Chapter 14, and I will talk to y'all later. Bye-bye.